So for today's task, we are going to use the e-commerce plugin more. Well, we need to bring back our site from last week, so we'll do that one more time. A lot of us have had that experience already, but we'll do it together one more time. On your desktop, remember, let's open, let's double click to launch the WAMP server icon. Double click to launch WAMP server. While we're here, and it's in my notes, while we're here, let's turn on that Apache rewrite module. So remember, once you've launched WAMP, you should get the little green W in the corner. If it disappeared, it's probably hidden inside of your double arrow there. So once you see the green W, click on it. We'll go over to the Apache section. And then Apache modules. We'll scroll down alphabetically to find rewrite module. It was odd, but for some people, you clicked on it, but it didn't activate. Sometimes you have to do it a couple of times, and then it'll pay attention. But in any event, scroll down, and you'll find rewrite module. Click it, and then you might see that your W goes from red to orange back to green. So we want to make sure that that is active or else our links won't work. We've set up those pretty links previously which would be my site slash about instead of my site slash p199. So um, this is what that accomplishes. All right, so did everyone get that working there? Secondly, we will create the database so that our project from last week can, can exist inside of. So you can click on the W again and select localhost at the top. localhost. That should open your web browser. It may or may not open more than one tab for you. That If it does, just close the other tabs and make sure you're only on the WAMP server tab. So once we're on that WAMP server tab, we have to then select the PHP my admin tool on the bottom left. So click on that PHP my admin. And then we've got databases. The Databases tab at the top, we'll click Databases. We'll create a database called WordPress. So inside of that Databases screen, we will click on, we will then select the, the box to create a brand new database, and remember to click Create. and it gives me the feedback database, WordPress has been created, and I see it there in my list. So we have to do this every time. We activate WAMP server, we activate rewrite module, we create a database, and then next we resurrect the site. And we've been doing it together, of course, several times. But uh, next time, which will be the last day, uh, I'm going to say uh, for you to try it completely on your own, and we'll see how we do uh, that way first. So, continuing, I've got a database. Next, I need the site from last week, so I'm going to minimize the folder. I mean, the, the web browser, minimize, and we'll go to the computer window. 
I opened the computer, then I'm going to go to the network folder. Open the network folder, classroom data drive Z. We'll scroll down to campus e-commerce 2. Open the campus e-commerce 2 folder. And I'm going to leave this window open so that I can open another computer window. So one window is my network folder here because I want to copy it last week's work. And then I open the new computer window where I can go back to the local disk C. The C as in cat, the, the, C, the local disk hard drive. So double click local disk C. Open that w, uh, open that WAMP folder, and then open the www folder. Question? So once I've got that www window or folder open, drag a copy. Just click and drag from the network folder. Get a copy of my last week's work. Just drag the whole folder, not what's inside, but the whole folder. Drag it from the network drive Z into your www folder in your drive C. Drag that over. So I'm going to drag it from there to here. Now I've got a copy of last week's work, but I'm going to rename the folder. I could leave this folder as is. Uh, it might cause me trouble when I try to view it in my web browser because it has spaces and an apostrophe. So that's why I'm going to rename the folder that I just copied, not in my network folder, but the one that you've just dragged to your folder. Rename that folder just to simply call it WAMP. I'm sorry, WordPress. Yeah, everyone signed it. I'll just take it right there. Now, I did forget to say, if you're using your own work from previous days, then that's fine. Continue to use your own project. But um, if you'd like to use mine, that's why we got it from the network folder. So it is a few steps to get ourselves our site back, but once we do, then we'll go right into uh, working with the with the plugin, the e-commerce. Okay, so that's done. I'm going to close these windows. I'm going to go back to my web browser where I had PHP my admin. It might still be open. Go back to your web browser, and then we'll go to the address http colon slash slash localhost slash wordpress slash installer.php. There's an installer file in that WordPress folder. That WordPress folder that a moment ago was called 2013-0713 Victor's Bakery. That's why we renamed it, so that we can simply type the address WordPress instead of having the longer name. Press Enter. If that was typed properly, then we would get to the duplicator installer. It has been several steps, so let me take a quick pause. Is everyone at this point? Anyone need a little help?
All right, so here we've got uh, the duplicator screen to resurrect our site. So on host, well, we will leave that as localhost. On name, this is the name of the database we just created, which is WordPress. The user is root, and there is no password, so don't type anything there. To make sure, <coughs> to make sure this is working, click on test connection, and I get success. If you didn't get success, just hold on a moment and I'll help you. But uh, most likely that means that you did not create a database. Or maybe you created a database WordPress with a capital W. So uh, capitalization does matter. Or maybe you type root with a capital R. This is all lowercase. If that looks good, then at the very bottom left I'll select I have read all the warnings and notices and then click run deployment. That's just saying you know what you're doing 
you are resurrecting a site, it may erase an existing site. That's why it asks you twice, are you sure? So yes, click OK. So this workflow is a common one and this is one that I personally use and also that one that we use in my company because Duplicator allows us to create a perfect copy of a site and then transfer it from folder uh, from server to server. And think about it this way also. Let's say you've got a site, victor.com, and I want to edit it without affecting the live version. I can make a copy like this and deploy it to my WAMP server or my testing server and then I will be able to work on it before affecting my real site. Once we come to this spot, you don't have to do anything unless you want to change the name of the, the site and such, but not necessary. Just click Run Update. I did not get any errors or warnings, which are good. So number one is done. Number two, I need to log into the site and save the permalinks meaning the, the address structure. So you go ahead and click Save Permalinks. Notice that opens a new tab. I've got this tab and then the previous one. This will ask us to log in. The username is admin and the password is password with a capital P. So admin and password, the worst username and password we can use, but just for the purposes of the class, it's good enough. Capi capital P for the password. Log in. And you get a bunch of messages at the top, don't worry about that. But the important part is that it's just confirming, basically. We've got post name as our setting for our addresses. Addresses, also known as the permalinks. Notice we're in the permalinks section of settings. So we're just confirming, yes, we're going to use the names of the posts, pretty links, instead of the default ugly links, which are just numbers in a database. We want post names, so all you need to do here is click Save Changes. It will save the changes. I'm going to close the permalink tab to take me back to the WordPress duplicator tab. It takes me back here. So step one is done, no errors. Step two, we say permalink. Step three would be that you test every single aspect of your site. Let's say that we did. And then step four, click File Cleanup so that it deletes the recovery files. Like that, it will confirm. Are you sure you want to do this? Yes, we don't want to accidentally revert our site back to a, an earlier per point. So that's why we click File Cleanup and then OK. That takes us back to this, back to the dashboard here on a new tab. And now we can close the Duplicator tab because we're done with it. We're back to our site. We can click Visit Site and then we will continue. We've got a perfectly resurrected site. This is where we left it last time. Any questions at this point? Did everyone get their site resurrected? All right, so one of the things we did last time, or well, one of the big things we did last time, was install the uh, e-commerce plugin. Does anyone remember the name of that plugin? It's WP e-commerce. That's the plugin we're using as our uh, as our e-commerce solution. And notice here, just I didn't even think about this, but as I did a quick search, WP Commerce versus WooCommerce. So you can look that up to see which uh, which solution is best for you. But we're using WP e-commerce. And notice we've got a brand new set of sec a set of pages here. Product page. Check out your account and transaction. We're going to get to that. We were still setting up some of the boring stuff. We were doing the boring stuff, the settings. Once that's set up in the beginning, then we don't have to deal with it much later on. So let's continue with that. Back to the dashboard if you're not there already. Hover over the settings 
uh, menu item and select store. So these are this was not here until we added that plugin, but now we've got settings, store. Let's go back to the store. Store settings. We dealt with general, we dealt with admin, and that's as far as we got. So notice we've still got these other things to work with. Taxes, shipping, payments, checkout, marketing, import, and presentation. I'm going to skip around a little bit. We're going to go through them all, but I'm going to skip over for the moment over to, uh, let's look at import. The question had been asked, what if I was on another kind of uh, site, and then now I want to use this site? Can I bring in my, my products and such? It, it can be done, but it's not as easy as, easy as you would think. Unfortunately, let's click on import. This is the ability that we have here, import products. You can import, you can import your products from a CSV file, exportable from most spreadsheet programs or other software. A CSV is a comma separated values file, which is just, you can see the example down here, which is just a list of of items separated by commas. It's this example CSV file. Banana, comma, yellow fruit, comma, contains potassium, comma, 0 0.67, comma, etc. Notice then the next item. Apple, uh, this is in quotes, comma, in quotes, red, round, juicy, and the link, comma, red, delicious, in quotes, comma. Well, there's a pattern here. The pattern is right here under supported fields columns supported here in their default order. So if you're trying to bring in a product database or a product catalog from another system, that other system, 99% of the time, all of that stuff is being held in a database. In the database, you can sort of think about it like a spreadsheet. You have rows and columns. And so here it's saying, this is expecting that your first column is a product name. Your second column is a description. Third is additional description. Fourth is price, etc. So you've got these columns. And then the first column, product name. So then you've got a row, apples, a row, column, uh, bananas, a row, kiwis, a row, oranges. And then all of the data for each one of those products goes in that row. So if you've got, if you can export your products from that other software and put it in these exact in this exact order then you can import it into this shopping cart now i've dealt with this going from one sort of shop to another i've dealt with it with wp commerce and i've dealt with it with another one called business catalyst now that's not wordpress at all that's business catalyst it's its own software and in that instance, what I had to do, what me and my team had to do, was spend a long time massaging the data from the other database into this format that is expected here. Because we had to copy and paste, cut and paste, we had to rearrange columns, and they had like 2,000 uh, 2, items. So it took a while. So if you've already got some other sort of shopping cart solution, it's going to be tricky to get it to this one, because it needs it in its own way. And they're all like that. If we were going out of WP Commerce over to WooCommerce or something else, most likely we would have to rearrange our data for that system. So it is doable to import from another solution, but it has to be in this order, or else maybe instead of it having your price properly set up, it's going to be put into the description. And therefore it will not show up when someone tries to buy it. It'll say price zero. And then your price will be a description instead of a real price. People will click buy and they'll get 40 copies of that zero priced item, even though it says $45 in the description. So that's what this import screen is about. We're not going to do anything here, but this is for yourself if you're bringing in products from another database. Any questions on this? Okay, let's skip over here to presentation. The last one, presentation. There's a white box on the right that says Advanced Theme Settings. No theme files have been moved to your WordPress theme folder. WP eCommerce provides you the ability to move your theme files to a safe place for theming control. 
If you want to change the look of your site, select the files you want to edit from the list and click the Move button. This will copy the template files to your active WordPress theme. What that gibberish is saying is, remember when we talked previously, someone had asked, well, there's something on screen that would, I would like to change. Can I change it? And my answer to that was, unless it shows up somewhere on your menu items here, you would have to edit it through code, HTML code. So these files here represent the code. Here is what does my category screen look like? What does my grid view look like? What does a single product look like? So each one of those items can be edited. And if I wanted to do that, I would select one of these items, single product, and click move template file. You don't have to do this. But it would then copy, it would make a copy of that file over to your theme directory, where then you can open up the code and edit it however you want to change something that perhaps wasn't available to you through a menu item. That, of course, is more advanced because then what you'll see if you do that is you're going to see a wall of code like that. And how many of you have experience in HTML? Raise your hand. Three or four people, five people out of a class of 25. So if you've got that experience, great. This should be pretty uh, straightforward to, to work with. If you don't have that experience, then unfortunately, then you only have the ability to edit what the theme author or the plugin author has provided you. So this is, in short, this is advanced. That's why it says advanced theme options, or theme settings. More tangibly, let's look at these options here. I'll mention most of them. Uh, button type, add to cart, or buy now. Buy now only works with PayPal standard. So that's usually what you want. You want people to add their stuff to your cart, or your stuff to their cart, and then keep shopping. You can have buy now so that someone clicks buy now and right away they pay. But most of the time, you'll want them to add maybe one or two more items. And anyway, we cannot select that until we set another option. So I recommend leave this one add to cart. I would recommend also leave hide add cart button. No. If you turn that off, meaning yes, you will have to have some other method for the person to then go uh, add that actual item to their shopping cart which usually means like some sort of advanced way through code. So for us, that doesn't make sense. Leave it alone. Yes? So maybe you have a product that's just out of stock. You can easily go in here, take the button off of it instead of having to do a whole bunch of stuff until your product comes home and you can turn the button back on. Yes, but this will apply to all your products. Okay. So if only one of your products is sold out, the other ones will not be viable either. Okay. We will be able to see how to individually make an item sold out or to remove it from the shopping cart, I mean from the catalog. This is the nuclear option, this is all or nothing for everything. Right. The, other, uh, the other way we will see a little bit later for fine-tuned surgical strikes. Product settings, show product ratings, that's up to you. Do you want people to add a rating to your products, yes or no? It's useful, but then of course you have to deal with people's negative uh, ratings. So for the moment I'll leave it on no. Maybe I want to build a audience goodwill first, a, a core set of, a core group of users that I know will rate me well before I let everyone rate. Stock Show stock availability, yes or no. Again, that's up to you. If you've got seven of those items, it might be a good idea to show that there is seven available. If it's something that you can continually create or produce, then no, no, no need to show availability because you always have avail availability. Display fancy purchase. On this one, I do recommend yes. Uh, what happens here is that when a person clicks Add to Cart, a little simple pop-up appears that says Continue Shopping <coughs> or Check Out. If you click yes, if you click no, nothing pops up. It just leaves you leaves the user as is. They click Add to Cart and that's it. Unfortunately, then a person might think, Did I really add it to cart? And they'll click three more times, and now they've added four of those items to their cart. That's obviously you want that, but not their credit card. So I would say yes, display fancy box, fancy purchase notification. It's a weird way to say it. Display yeah. fancy. <laughs> yes. And it's not that fancy. <laughs> display per item shipping, it's on yes, that's fine. 
unless you want to remove it. That's basically going to show how much each item is going to cost, how much its shipping is going to cost. If you don't, if you want it all added up as one value, you can click no. What's the benefit of having I don't really think there's much of a negative or benefit either or. It's just a personal thing, and the default is fine. Display link in title. This one will make more sense when we actually do it, but imagine we've got a screen full of 10 products, thumbnails. If we click on the title of one of the products, then it can show us a full-paged uh, description of the of that one product. That's what this is saying. Disable link and title? No. Which, this is again, this is backwards like when we vote. Vote yes on this to not fund that. Um, this is backwards. So, disable link and title? No. Which means yes, have a link in the title. So we will be able to click a product to show us a full screen description of the product by leaving it on no. If we put yes, what's that? It's not disabled. Yes, it's not disabled. If we do disable it, then clicking on the title will do nothing. We will not see a full description of the product. Now, you might think, of course I want to see a full description. Maybe not. It depends on your product, your, your theme, your site, your own preferences. We'll leave this no for the moment. We'll test it, and if you want the other method, it's, a, it's an easy change. This next one I would def I would recommend on, but that depends on your product. Add quantity field? Yes, so if I'm trying to sell t-shirts, maybe a person wants to buy three of them. So they can then select, give me three of them. If you turn that off, it will only select let them select one. They can still buy three of them, but they'll have to click Add to Cart three times. Instead of simply selecting three, Add to Cart. Product pages settings, product display, default view. These two are linked together and we won't really be able to work with them because notice list view is disabled and grid view is disabled. We get the default view which is a long uh, list of products. If we wanted them to be viewed in a in a grid view or the other list view, that's part of the the, the purchase, the extra purchase of this plugin. Remember I said the plugin has extra features will be fine with the default. So then these over here don't do that much. Products per row, well, we won't really have rows, we've only got one default. Yes. How much did we expect, because uh, you said it costs money? Yes, last week when we looked at it, uh, there was a price in there, I believe, uh, $89? Anyone remember the price from the add-ons? Like 40, so. $40, yeah, something like that. Uh, so forty to eighty dollars or something like that. For which? Well, the, remember we looked at the gold cart. Oh, okay. So gold cart gives you a few more features, and then maybe those forty dollars are not necessary. We can get by with what we've got here. And honestly, for the most of the clients that my company has worked with, we've used the default completely free one, and it works just fine for them. If they need a little bit more you know, charging the client $40, even $90 is not so bad. And then we can get these extra features. So all of these right here, don't worry about them just yet because they only apply to the grid view. We cannot activate the grid view until we pay for it. Show list of categories, yes or no. Again, that depends on how you want to show everything. I don't think it's very useful we will be able to show a better list of categories in another way. So like what product category you want to display on the product. This one again, don't worry about it, we will display things in a much nicer way here. The default is every one of your products will show up on one page. Well, Amazon doesn't work that way. We have a section on, you know, computers and a section on DVDs and a section on cat food. Not every product on one long page. So in another method, we will be able to divide that up. Oh, really? So everyone rush out to buy that. 50% off. It might be useful, but um, they might have the sale again at another point. Sort product by time uploaded and descending. This is, again, what you should decide to do. 
time uploaded might be the best way because then it would show the latest product. Maybe you want to show it that way. Maybe you want to show your products in the order of price or in the order of name or maybe you want to arrange it painstakingly this product first, this product second. Whatever you'd like, but I'm going to leave it on time uploaded. That would be linked to another option um, somewhere else over here. Show breadcrumbs. Um, this one, again, is up to you. Doesn't matter any positive or negative. What breadcrumbs are is going to be a simple menu at the top of your screen that says, for example, baby clothes. Next comes girls. Next comes, you know, ages 0 to 2 months. So it's just basically a very simple menu that shows you where you're at in the hierarchy of things. And what's useful about that is that each one of those items would be clickable. So if you've got babies, girls, one-year-old, then if you click on the girls here, it'll take you one level back, and you'll see all those kinds of products. So it's on, it's off by default, but you can turn it on if you'd like. I'm going to leave it as is. Maybe just uh, cluttering your screen. Depending on your theme, you might have a bunch of things up at the top of the screen, and this is just another thing. Product groups or product displays. The default is fine, product group only which will be all products and sliding product group. Again, we're going, to, um, we're going to display our products better than some of these defaults, so we'll leave that one the same. Show subcategories. Again, if you've got, you know, um, clothing, and then you've got a subcategory, men's and women's, and then a subcategory under that, medium, small, large. You can show all of that on screen if you'd like. Do that one. Replace page title with product. Don't worry about that one. That one is that it would um, put the title of the product at the top of the screen, which it's which it already does. So I don't think there's much of a difference, but that's an option. We won't really see what it looks like until we actually load up the store with products. So don't worry about it. Shopping cart. There's different ways that we can display the shopping cart. One is in its own page. One is, is, a, is as a widget. One is something called drop shop, which you have to pay for. And one is manual with that line of PHP code. So we'll leave the default. But actually, we can use both of them at once, page or widget. And widget would, would be like we add the shopping cart to the sidebar or the footer or at the head. Would you like to display the text plus postage and tax? So you'll see, you know, uh, hats, $5.99. And if you select yes here, plus postage and tax. So that's up to you to display or not. Depending on your theme, it may prominently display your description of your categories or not. So I'll leave that no for the moment. Show product category thumbnails. Again, uh, that depends on your theme. We, we're we're going to create categories. Let's have a, I'm a pet shop. So I've got a cat category and a dog category. Uh, I can have a thumbnail for those categories, yes or no. But it may not appear depending on your theme. Do I want to say how many items are in that category? I've got seven dog toys and four cat toys, yes or no. And then we can display the categories as a grid uh, instead of as a list. These are some default sizes for thumbnails and so forth. Uh, these, these defaults are fine. We can always change them later. You might upload a picture that is not a perfect square. Notice these dimensions are squares. So it says choosing yes means that the thumbnails are cropped to exact dimensions. Normally thumbnails are proportional. 
So if you leave it on the default, no, it'll take that rectangular um, picture and actually squash it down to a square. It'll look weird. If you leave, if you put yes, it'll crop the edges, but then it might crop too much. So the moral is, before uploading your your picture thumbnails, decide on what dimensions of pictures you'll be using, and if they're going to be square or rectangle. That way, when you upload your pictures, they don't get squashed or stretched or cut. Would you like to show thumbnails? Yes, I want to know what I'm buying. Use Lightbox effect for product images. That one's useful, and it's on for yes, which means they'll, they can see the thumbnail. You might have uploaded a nice big 600 pixel sized picture, and you only have a thumbnail of 148. But if you leave on Lightbox effect, when someone clicks it, they'll get a nice big zoom view of it. And then what I like to do, this couples with it, what I like to do on the Lightbox script, select color box. This gives you a nice uh, big zoom box that appears, that fades out the background with a forward and back button. It's nice. Thick box is a little basic, color box is a little nicer. Is that the flash? It's like flash gallery, but it's not, it's not reliant on flash. It's HTML5. So it's mobile friendly. use pagination, I'm going to say yes. You probably will have a few products you want to display, and it's going to be annoying to have a, a big list of 20 products on one page. So just in the beginning, to so see how it works, we're going to say pagination, yes, and we're going to say three products per page. Where would you like to display the next page, previous page? It says at the bottom, but I kind of like both, because I know for me it's annoying to go all the way to the bottom of the screen to go next page. I want to see it at the first at the top or at the bottom if I'm there. And the very last thing, use intense debate comments. So this is a way for, for you to have this popularity and, and chatting and, and reviews and such by creating an account at intense debate and activating it here and setting it up. Honestly, I haven't looked into it very much. I don't know how much it costs at the moment. But you can probably get most of that functionality through free WordPress plugins. I'm pretty sure Intense Debate is not free. I don't know the price. We've made a bunch of setting changes, so make sure to click Save Changes at the bottom. Any, uh, any questions on this screen? Okay, so uh, let's back up here. Let's look at marketing. So the screen has some technical stuff and then a few useful things. Users who bought this also bought. You can activate that and it will give them those suggestions. Of, of other products. So there's the terms cross-selling and upselling. Let's say I've got a DVD that costs ten dollars, uh, a horror movie. Cross-selling would be that then after they buy a product or add it to their cart, they get a suggestion. People that like this one, The Exorcist, also liked The Evil Dead. So for the same price, it's a horror movie, it cross-sells them. It's in the same horizontal dimension. Horror, DVD, $10. Upselling, yes? Do you have to literally go in and link all your products, or would it naturally be a summarizing? If you're using the different categories and tags and such, organization, properly, it will, it will work. Upselling is, okay, they bought that $10 DVD of The Exorcist, but upselling would be, well, why don't you buy the $35 Criterion Collection version? of The Exorcist that comes with four hours of director's commentary. So that one is $35, so it's upselling them. Instead of the $10 one, you know, bait and switch, kind of, you get them up to the $35 one instead of the $10 one. And you see this yourself on every site. People who bought this bought that, and then at some it might be obvious that it's an upsell, and some it might not. But those might be useful, so I would turn that on. You have to decide if you don't want that or not, but 
Again, if you want to sell one product, you probably want to sell other related products. And let's say they're very happy with what they bought, so they want to tell their friends and family. This is a share this button here. However, I don't like this one here. I like the one that comes built in with WordPress, with the Jetpack plugin. So I'm not going to turn that one on. The one with Jet from Jetpack is more powerful. It lets you choose more of the services and how they how they show up. I think that one's a little bit basic. Very similar to this Facebook like. So I don't I won't turn that one on either. So the share this and the Facebook don't need them. We've got better versions. And then here, customer how customers found us. And the how did you find out about us drop down box at checkout. So when someone's going to check out, it's going to ask them, how did you find out about this? So there's a few options. Unfortunately, you activate this, and there's no option somewhere like, what would you like to put in that field? The defaults, I don't forget, don't remember what they are. You know, radio, TV, website, Google, I don't remember what they are. It would be edited, it would be editable via the, the code editing screen, but um, the default ones are, are fine. And what that will do is will help you collect information about your, your customers. It's going to be a drop-down box. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, radio buttons are a little bit more, uh, take up a little more space. They clutter things up, but a drop-down box, everything exists in one box. It just drops down. Radio buttons would be taking up more space. Don't worry about this product RSS uh, feed thing here. RSS is a technology that's fallen by the wayside a lot. Uh, how many of you have heard of RSS before? How many of you still use RSS, however? Okay, so a few of you heard of it, but almost no one uses it anymore. RSS is sort of like Web 1.5 technology. We're currently in the world of Web 2.0 which are websites that are very interactive, where people can add comments, user-generated content, Facebook, Instagram, Amazon, all of these are Web 2.0 sites, Yelp. Think back five or more years ago, those were Web 1.0 sites. Those are sites that you just visited the site, you read something or whatever, and then you're done with it. You didn't really interact with it. And then Web 1.5, in the middle, was RSS feeds. You would subscribe to a website and then the latest posts would come to your inbox. And RSS is still around, WordPress has it built in. But not that many people use it as much. So don't worry about that. If you're also going to use Google Merchant, there's something for you here, but that's out of our scope. We can, have, we can set up Google Analytics to track more data about your, your customers and your sales and such. Again, that's out of our scope. If you take my SEO class or my advanced Google class, we touch on it, but still this is a little bit specific. Um, WordPress gives you some good statistics built in, and if you take that SEO class, and there we go into more detail about Google Analytics, more than we really have time to get into here. Those two lines of code, you just enable it, it's already in there. You don't have to copy paste and go back to that. Which ones? In uh, the, the SEO class, we, 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 um, for Google Analytics, we, there was a couple of lines of code that we put in the metadata. Mm -hmm. If you click that, it just does it for you. Yeah, you're pretty much plugging in your Google Analytics code right there, and oh. you save it, and then it uh, pretty Easy much, Yeah, and it gives you, you know, other advanced features, but yeah, if you took that class, it, it should make sense. So we changed a couple of things here. Make sure you click Save. Continuing to go backwards, let's look at the checkout screen. As is the way that this that this is set up is set up pretty well, but I'll mention a couple of things. Um, for example, force user, user registration. Users can check out without a user account, or users must register before checking out. So you might think that's going to be useful. People have to register and put in their email and whatever, and then they can buy. Great. 
that might be useful, but that will contribute to what is known as friction. And friction is just a fancy term that means anything that makes things harder for your customers. So I know that when I'm trying to, let's say, comment on a website, I have a great response to something. I just want to comment. So I'm looking for a box that says, you know, comment, put in your name, post. A lot of times then I would see register for our site and then comment. So I say, okay, I really want to say this. So I'll go to registration. I do this and that. Now check your email to confirm your registration. Okay, so now I'm like, forget it. And then I go do something else. That was, uh, that was a lot of friction. It prevented me from doing what I wanted to do. So for checkouts, you might want to decrease as much friction as possible for your people to buy your product. So the default here of let people buy an account, uh, buy without an account is good. They will have the option to create an account later if they want. But in order for the, if you put up a speed bump on their way to the checkout screen, they're going to do a U-turn. Now notice also, if you do select users must register, you, you're going to get yourself into a conundrum. Because if you do not activate this option in the settings general, don't, don't, uh, don't do this, but if you go to the settings general, there's an option here. Anyone can register? Mine is off. So if I say, a person must register before buying a product, but I've completely deactivated the ability to register. No one can ever register, therefore no one can buy anything. <laughs> so be careful about that. If you do activate that, because maybe, yes, it's very important for people to register, great. Remember to go over to the settings screen, general, and turn on anyone can register, or else you have no registrants and therefore no buyers. This one is weird that it's that the default is so wrong. This is contributing to user friction actually. Shipping same as billing. So there will be a boxes for people to fill in shipping and boxes to fill in uh, shipping and, and for billing. Now that's standard. What I'm saying is it's also standard that someone fills in their billing information and then that automatically gets copied to shipping information or if it's not automatic there's a button that says you know shipping same as billing the default says users <coughs> must re-enter shipping address fiction they're gonna have to refill in all their home address and phone number and everything so the best option here to reduce friction click on the first one. Enable same as billing checkbox with shipping address fields. So all they need to do is fill in their fill in their shipping, click that button, and then that goes to the billing. So make sure you turn that one on. Security and encryption. Force users to use SSL or allow site to be used insecurely and unencrypted. Now I know that sounds scary, but you're not going to be able to really select the first one until you purchase the SSL certificate. So that's a thing that you buy yearly from a reputable company like Bluehost, GoDaddy, Host a Monster, whatever. It's about ninety dollars a year and that basically adds extra layer of security to your website, the little lock in the corner. So you need to buy that, you need to configure that, and then when you come back here turn on force users to use SSL so then they will always see that little lock in the corner. It'll make people feel more comfortable that this is a legitimate secure site. But if we activate this right now and don't have the SSL certificate, the site won't work because it's going to channel people to the secure site and it doesn't exist. So it's going to force people to go to, instead of your normal address, it's going to force people over to HTTPS victorsbakery.com and I never bought security, I never bought the SSL, so therefore there's no HTTPS on my site and the site will not work. So if you ever wondered, the S is for security. But it's not free. And the prices are about $90 per year. You actually 
see some deals sometimes if you buy a brand new account at GoDaddy or Bluehost or whatever they often say first year SSL free so maybe on that first year you make enough money to then purchase it for the next five years so you have that security feature and as I said on the previous week um, the this SSL and the security you don't on a technical level you don't need it for the most important aspect of our site which is the credit card transaction PayPal will take care of that at a certain point once a person is added to the cart and clicked check out the handoff will happen where a person is led from our site over to a secure PayPal screen with their 128 bit encryption uh, is protecting everything that transaction happens your site never gets a copy of that credit card your site never sees it. PayPal does its thing, vouches for the user, takes the money, and bounces them back to your site, and it says, thank you for your purchase. So it, you, you never have the credit card. What you will have is their shipping information and their, their email and their phone and whatever information you ask for, and, and that could be you know, a liability there. But at least the credit card information is not something that's going to be stored on your site. Victor, on my uh, on, on my Dreamweaver site, mm -hmm. it comes sent to me from PayPal with an email. Then I have like an email sheet that I can print it if I wanted to. On WordPress, uh, does, how does it come back to you? Is it a post on your page or does it come back as an email? It's going to be an email also. Pay pay PayPal account. operates that that way most commonly and that it sends and receives emails and you and, and you log into your account on PayPal and you see all your transactions and deal with refunds and all of that. So it's the same workflow. So what I said about the information that you capture is listed right here. Check out form fields. So right now this is the default form field, the default checkout form. I can create a new one. Uh, but this is the default one. You're going to see a screen that says you're billing contact details. It's going to ask for the person's first name, last name, address, city, state, country, postal code, phone, email, and then a section of shipping address, and then the same. So if you want to change any of that text that appears, instead of it saying first name, last name, you know, you can make it say first name, family name, address, city, state, country, postal code, you mean zip code phone, email. So you can change what text appears on screen very easily. You can change the order of things. Maybe you want an email. You want them to type the email first. Just grab that little gripper section right here. So you get the four-headed arrow. Click on that and just drag it into the order that you want. And now my, um, my checkout form has those edits. So the type of input box shows this is a heading, that's some text, that's an address, there's an internal code, and then it says display this on screen or not. Is it mandatory? Does a person have to fill that in? Why would they have to fill out the country but not the state and zip? Yeah, that's a kind of funny there. So I would recommend turn those on mandatory. So yes, notice zip code and, and state are not mandatory, just the country. So I would turn those in, turn those on. Phone is not mandatory, but you could do that if you'd like. And then uh, remember we activated that option on that other screen for the shipping to automatically fill itself in. If we wanted another field, let's say in addition to the phone number, there's phone number. On the right side, we've got a plus symbol. Notice we cannot delete some of them, but we can add, click add, and right below it, it adds a new field. Will it be a text field? So it's one line of text. Will it be a text area where they can write a little paragraph? Will it be a heading so it divides your form? Will it be a selectable item, like a drop-down? Will it be a radio button, one radio button? Will it be one checkbox? 
let's say this is text area and I'll write special instructions. I will not put it mandatory. You can if you want to, of course. But now this will be that when someone is checking out, there will be an option there that says special instructions. Maybe you're selling one-off items. Maybe you need it customized. Maybe you, maybe you sell it with engraving and you want your item, a name on that engraved item. So with a little bit of text, you know, special engraving instructions. Delete one of them? The ones that are deletable will have a little <coughs> minus. Country, among the United States. So you can't delete it, but what about hiding it? You know, notice that other column says display. Display. Mm -hmm. So instead of deleting country, just uncheck, uncheck it. So we can have more than one checkout form for different sorts of purposes. Maybe you're doing, um, maybe you're doing uh, also digital products. We don't need a shipping address and such. So we can create another form, add new form set, and create a new form, checkout form, for digital products. Any changes that you made, remember to save. multiple forms, where does it tell it? How do you know which forms it's going to ask for? On the, uh, on the checkout screen that we designate, we can say which form to use. So we'll look at taxes and shipping and payments right after our break because those require a little bit more explanation and setup. So it's just about time for our break. We'll take our first break, uh, and when we come back, we'll look at some more settings. Then once we've got all the settings done, we'll then start adding products, see how the store looks, and keep working. <coughs>